Well, good morning and welcome. This is Morning Mail for Friday, May the 27th, 2022. Good to be with you today. Trust that your day is doing well. I appreciate you taking the time to join in with us live this morning or just whenever through the day or whatever day it might be. We're beginning to look at the final chapter of 1 Timothy, and today we're going to be looking at the first two verses of that chapter. Before we do that, let's stop and pray. Loving Father, we're grateful for the day and its blessings, for your being with us and watching over us. We thank you for the past night's rest and the new day. Be with us, Father, through this day as we seek to go about the activities that lie before us. May we approach them with strength, courage, wisdom, and may we use them wisely in your service. Thank you, Father, for the Bible, for the message it gives to us from you about how to live, how we need you, and how you have provided for our redemption. May we always read, listen, and follow your word. Father, we continue to be mindful of Uvalde, Ukraine, our whole country, and we just pray, Father, for all of those situations. Bless us in our time this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The last chapter of 1 Timothy continues the various instructions of the previous section with no specific theme dominant. The first section of chapter 6 deals with slaves. The second section is an expose of the false teachers who have already been mentioned ending up with a caution about riches. The third section deals with the charge to Timothy, containing a reference to the baptismal confession and a wonderful doxology. The last major section of chapter 6 deals with advice to rich men, and the letter ends with a final appeal to Timothy and a salutation. Well, let's look at the first two verses. Those first two verses of chapter 6 are about slaves. Let's read them. 1 Timothy 6, verses 1 and 2. All who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved teach and preach these principles. Before we're looking at Paul's words more closely, we need to consider three questions. The first concerns why these verses are in the letter. Why did Paul include instructions to slaves? Well, the answer is simple, because a need existed for this teaching. The inclusion of Regulations for slaves may seem strange to us, but it would not have been considered unusual in Paul's day. Some historians have estimated that up up to half of the population of the Roman Empire consisted of slaves. Slaves did the bulk of the work, from the most menial task to the management of estates and the tutoring of children. Slaves were an integral part of many households. More to the point, in the average congregation, slaves made up a considerable percentage of the membership. 
This is reflected in the New Testament and confirmed by early uninspired writers. Paul could not ignore this segment of the brotherhood. Their special challenges needed to be addressed. This brings us to the second question, a side issue, but a puzzle in the mind of Christians today. Why did God not abolish slavery, or at least issue a strong admonition against it? In days past, some used such passages as these first two verses of 1 Timothy 6 as, quote, proof, in quote, that God approved of slavery. They concluded that slavery itself was not wrong, just the abuse of it. Well, today, we reason that much evil could have been avoided if God had made clear that slavery was contrary to his will. Now, we cannot be certain why God tolerated slavery as he did, but possible factors have been suggested. On occasion, God allowed, for a limited time, situations to exist even though he did not approve of them. See Matthew chapter 19, verse 8, Acts 17, verse 30. God's way of affecting society has usually not been through revolution, but through what we might call evolution or change, not by force, but by the leavening effect of inspired teaching. Also, in that day, the abrupt abolishment of slavery would have brought about the collapse of society. We must remember that slaves were considered tools, living, breathing tools. What would it be like if every tool in today's world were suddenly destroyed? From the simplest garden tool to the most complex computer. Well, the consequences would be unimaginable. Further still, freeing people from sin was an infinitely higher priority for a Christian evangelist than freeing people from slavery. Well, a final question could be asked. Since most do not live where slavery is the norm, what value do these verses have for us? Most of us spend considerably more time in the workplace, providing for ourselves and our dependents, than we do in the worship services. Further, many of us work far someone instead of having others work for us. So there are similarities between ourselves and first century slaves. We should be concerned about how our, our Christianity affects how we behave in the workplace. The Bible is full of principles relating to our time in the workplace. We are to be honest in our dealings. We should be conscientious workers. My favorite text regarding working for others is Colossians 3, verse 23. Quote, Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord, rather than for men. End quote. Here in 1 Timothy 6, verses 1 and 2, we have additional insight regarding what a Christian employee should do and be. Our text begins with the words, quote, 
all who are under the yoke as slaves, end quote, verse 1a. Under the yoke described one who was a slave. So the opening words are somewhat repetitive. Perhaps the repetition was emphasized, uh, emphasizing the crushing burden of being a slave. Paul's directive to those under the yoke was to regard their masters, their own masters, as worthy of all honor, in quote, verse 1b. Masters is from a plural form of the word despot, which refers to one with absolute ownership and uncontrolled power. One could easily resent any person with absolute control over his life. But Paul said to regard him as worthy of all honor. Now, all honor would include both outward and inward respect. It is possible to put on a display of respectful obedience while the heart is filled with bitterness. Doing right is important but so is having a proper attitude. Now, some employees will not like the application for us today. If we work for others, we should regard them as worthy of all honor. We should be the best employee possible, always doing our best and even going beyond what we are asked to do. Now, the exception to this is if an employer asks us to do something illegal or immoral. See Acts 5, verse 29. Further, we should maintain a respectful attitude. If we are incapable of doing that, we have an option a slave did not have we can quit. Well, why is it important for Christian slaves then and Christian employees today to have this mentality? It was and is important for the individual himself so that he might be pleasing to the Lord. But Paul had an additional concern. He said slaves should be respectful, quote, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against, in quote, chapter 6, verse 1c. Be spoken against is more literally translated, be blasphemed. Paul was concerned about God's name and God's doctrine. A cheerful, obedient Christian slave employee, reflected favorable on the name and teachings of God, while a surly, defiant Christian slave employee reflected unfavorably. This is a powerful statement about influence. We may not think we influence others, but we do, whether negatively or positively. Now, in verse 2, Paul turned his attention to Christian slaves who had Christian masters. It takes only a little thought to see how this presented a special challenge for Christians in the first century. Slaves and masters worshipped side by side. Thus, Paul's admonition, those who have believers as their masters, must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren. Now, the word translated be disrespectful is the same as that translated look down on back in chapter 4, verse 12. Instead of disrespecting their Christian masters, Christian slaves were to serve them all the more. Verse 2b. 
Christian slaves were to be even more respectful, even more diligent in their service to the Christ, their Christian masters than they would have been to unbelieving masters. Now, Paul said this should be true, quote, because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved, end quote, verse 2c. Christian slaves were to render that kind of service because those who benefited from their service were believers, even as they were. Again, application can be made to today, this time to a situation in which a Christian employee has a Christian employer. When this is the case, the employee may be tempted not to exert himself as he would for a non-Christian employer. Paul's word to any who find themselves in this situation is this. Because he is your brother, you should be even more respectful and do even more than is asked of you with a positive attitude. Well, we're going to come back on Monday with Morning Mail, and we will consider verses 2 through 11, Paul's final words on false teachers. Uh, before we go this morning, let's look forward to Sunday. This coming Sunday morning at 9.30, our Bible classes will begin. In the auditorium class, you may recall, I began teaching last week with a uh, theme for this series of lessons called Our God is an Awesome God. And we're going to continue with that theme Sunday and for uh, a few weeks through the summer. This is a survey of some of the Old Testament prophets' inspired calls for God's people to repent and come back to God. At 10.30 this coming Sunday morning, our Sunday morning worship service will take place. We will, as always, have opportunity for songs, prayers, and down the first day of the week, the opportunity to remember the death and suffering of Jesus as we partake of the communion, the Lord's Supper. The sermon Sunday morning will continue our series of In the Footsteps of Jesus. And this Sunday, we will be talking about serving like Jesus did. Now, this is a fifth Sunday, this coming Sunday, uh, the 29th. So immediately after our services, we are having a potluck meal, as our usual practice is. And then as soon as the meal is done, we will have a short devotional in the fellowship hall before we clean up and go home and be dismissed for the day. There will be no 6 p.m. service. I hope that you can join with us in person on Sunday. If not, at least you can watch the Bible class and the morning worship on Facebook or YouTube. It's always a joy to see you when you're here, but it's always also a joy to know that you are watching and listening. Well, let's close our time for this Friday with a prayer, and then we'll be done uh, for this week. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Father, we're so grateful again for the day you've blessed us with, and for these instructions about how to conduct ourselves as employees, as your children who work for others. And Father, may we look at these things that we've re read and talked about this morning and see the importance and the significance of them and make them a part of our daily lives. Thank you again so much for Jesus and the Bible. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I pray your Friday is a great day. And tomorrow, Saturday, it's supposed to be hot this weekend around 100 degrees with some wind blowing. Take care. Keep hydrated. 
Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday and then again on Monday morning.